it's the last week of June. Next week, we move into the back half of 2024. So today, I'm going to share my picks for the biggest surprises and biggest disappointments of 2024 thus far. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Let me know what are your picks for the biggest surprises and biggest disappointments of the year. Now, keep in mind how I define these terms. Biggest surprises means movies that exceeded my expectations. Doesn't even mean they're good. They're just that much better than I thought they would be. And biggest disappointments doesn't mean that they're bad, but it means that they are below what I was expecting from them. So even some of the movies listed on here might seem like odd picks because maybe I liked them, but they're still in my disappointments category. And other ones, I wasn't crazy about them, but they were still surprises because of the definition of the term. And let's get started with my picks for the biggest surprises. First up, Ordinary Angels. And this is based on real life events and a movie that wasn't remotely on my radar. I think it's from Angel Studios. It's a, very much a throwback to past decades, inspirational dramas. And it stars Hilary Swank and Alan Richson. I think Alan Richson is playing his career very wisely recently. Of He's got his Jack Reacher, where he plays big action movie guy. But in this, he's essentially just playing Broken Father. That it's purely a dramatic role in the fact that he's 6'4 and 240 pounds of pure muscle has nothing to do with anything. But... It's a movie that's able to kind of tug at all the right heartstrings, where you you have these two broken leads that in this moment need each other and also have their flaws that cause a lot of problems and everything kind of going along with it, but just has such an emotionally satisfying conclusion. Then we have Monkey Man. This is the first film from Dev Patel, who wrote it, directed it, and stars in it. It's an action movie. Some people called it kind of like Indian John Wick. I, like, I get the comparison. It's not totally unfounded. I don't think it's a great comparison uh, because the John Wick movies kind of have this relentless pace to them that they move very quick from action beat to action beat to action beat. And this is much more of a slow build to a big, gigantic action set piece and then a slow rebuild to a second big, gigantic action set piece. But there's really just these two big set pieces. And it, it does have a guy in a suit and a nightclub with stylized lighting. Um, but so this was a movie that was not on my radar whatsoever, didn't know anything about it, and then turned out to be this real solid action film. Maybe a little bit too ambitious, maybe tried a few too many things in it, but it's the sort of movie that shows you the potential that a film has and what he could do with his future films. Babes, this is a movie that would not have been on my radar whatsoever, except that I saw it at South by Southwest. So I went in, having not seen a trailer because they hadn't put out a trailer yet, I knew almost nothing about it, and sat down and watched this really good comedy. It's basically Bridesmaids for Pregnancy. It's an R-rated crass comedy about female friendship, but instead of it being about the dynamic changes that happen with a bridal party in marriage, it's about how pregnancy, children coming along, changes friendships. It's very crass, but the crassness feels earned because pregnancy, it's a bodily function. Bodily function tend to be crass. And there's a lot of crass things, that icky things that go along with pregnancy. It's a beautiful thing. Also, sometimes not so beautiful and the movie has a lot of fun with that. So a movie that kind of came out of nowhere that I, I thoroughly enjoy. The Idea of You. This is another one that I saw at its world premiere at South by Southwest, was able to take my wife. We were in the front row and Anne Hathaway was there. And so she was 10 feet away from us. Very cool. I hadn't read the book at the point in time I saw the movie. I don't even, the trailer, I think it just dropped, but I didn't watch it. So I just went in and took my wife because Anne Hathaway rom-com didn't even realize it was from the director of The Big, Big Sick, which I thought was a great romantic dramedy from several years back. And if I had, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have been as surprised by the film. But once again, this director was able to deliver another film that it is a rom-com. It has kind of the ridiculous scenarios, but it plays it more grounded and it makes the drama, the conflict feel earned. And it's a, about how... No matter how old you are, how much success you have, you're still figuring yourself out 
in this context of this, this romance that's unlikely romance taking place that has a lot of complications to go along with it. So as a movie that I was like, I don't know what this thing is. Uh, absolutely surprised me. And then my, my wife has watched it roughly 1,000 times in the six weeks since it dropped on Amazon Prime. Then we have Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, part two. Now, this is where when I talk about biggest surprises, it doesn't necessarily mean a movie is good. It just means it's that much better than expectations. So in the case of this movie, the first movie was dreadful. It was my pick for the worst movie of last year. So my expectations going into the second film, quite low, <laughs> not very good. And then the movie itself, it's not fantastic. It's not gonna be anywhere near my top 10 at the end of the year, but it also won't be near my bottom 10. Thus, by definition, it surprised me and far exceeded my expectations for the film. Uh, the big thing here is that this movie essentially delivered what I wanted the first movie to deliver with a better backstory, better lore, more memorable kills, more interesting kills. It had a bigger budget, not that it had a big budget whatsoever. It's still a very low budget film, but it wasn't a bare bones budget. So it could just deliver more stuff. It had a little bit more humor to it. It was a little bit more self-aware. So everything that was utterly wrong with the first film is made a little bit better. Thus surprised me. I still think it's a little bit too self-serious. It needed a little bit more of that humor to it, but absolutely seems like they heard the criticism. They learned, they growed, growed. They growed. They learned, they grew, they improved. Thus it surprised me. The Beekeeper. This is the latest Jason Statham action film and it dropped in January. Now, Jason Statham action films, quality wise, they can be all over the place, but you know, he hasn't had the best run recently with, you know, his star led action movies. And it came out in January. January, its reputation is changing a little bit, but it does have very much the reputation for being a dumping ground month where you have a movie that you don't think is very good, so you just dump it in January to get it out there. And it turned out The Beekeeper, solid Jason Statham action film. One of the best Jason Statham, like, mid-tier action films. Obviously, like, Jason Statham, sometimes he's in large-budget studio films. And then there's kind of the, the mid-budget ones that are just starring vehicles for him that we don't get as many of those anymore. They don't do as well as they used to do. And he's done a lot of them that are pretty forgettable. This is one of the good ones. This is one of the ones that had a better premise, better buildup. Uh, the scope and size of it felt bigger. It was funnier. The action was better. And so you went in just kind of expecting a throwaway, totally forgettable Jason Statham movie. And you got a good Jason Statham movie. A beekeeper, a beekeeper? Well, that's not good. This is, when I go to a Jason Statham action movie, I'm only expecting a B movie. I'm, I want it for the schlock value. And that's what this movie gave me. So absolutely, it, it exceeded my expectations. Once again, it won't be in my top 10 of the year, but it was a very pleasant surprise. Last one on the surprise is The First Omen. Now, these recent horror prequels long delayed legacy sequels, reputation, quality, it's all over the place. You don't know what to expect from them. Adding to that, you know, The Omen is a franchise that it's been almost 20 years since the last entry. And, you know, the the original run over 40 years ago. So here we're going to do a prequel to the original and you, you get really nervous. Also, I, I just don't really like nun horror, nun exploitation, or whatever. That's not my brand of horror. Don't enjoy the nun films in the Conjuring universe that much. Immaculate that came out right around the same time as this movie and had a very similar premise. Uh, it had some moments that I really dug, but it's not a world that I, I get into all that much. And the first Omen, on pretty much every level, surprised me. That I thought it did a really good job of being a prequel to the first Omen. Uh, the well, the movie, though, <laughs> that's the title of this movie. It is a very good prequel to the original Omen, where this is kind of like the Rogue One to the Omen franchise, that it does this perfect lead up into that film. And it, it took some of the weirder stuff in the first film 
that you're like a jackal. Really? What's what's going on here? They're really going to do that. And they go for it. They lean into it and they, they don't shy away from the strangeness. They play it out, build out the conspiracy theory, the paranoia, all the stuff that you want from a classic Omen film. It's in there. It is a prequel that answers questions I wasn't asking with answers that I do find interesting and satisfying. So a prequel that did its job. I was not expecting to like this film. I was also not expecting this movie to be as uh, graphic in the pregnancies either. And it goes for it multiple times. So it was a very pleasant surprise. So far exceeded my expectations. There are some movies that did not live up to my expectations, unfortunately. So let's move on over to the disappointment list. Kicking things off, Madam Web. Now, to be perfectly fair, I didn't have particularly high expectations for this film. I thought the premise was also deeply, always going to be deeply flawed. But I went in expecting basically Final Destination as a superhero thriller in the world of Spider-Man. And there's something to that that's a little bit interesting. Final Destination is a superhero movie. There's something you can do with that 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 could be cool. And then I saw the movie. I expected the premise to be weak. I didn't expect the execution to be as bad as it was. And I didn't expect there to be so little in it that was creative, interesting, engaging at all. Where you had the Final Destination thing... And they didn't find any way to do something clever, interesting like that. That It's just you're watching this, what? A Spider-Man movie without Spider-Man? Wait, it's the origin story for the lady that is on the phone with the Spider-Man spinoff characters that aren't even Spider-Women yet? What? The origin to the origin of the... What? What are you doing? And then there's bad ADR. There's plot points that just make no sense. Um, I mean, just just wacky as can be that somebody thought that this was good enough to film. Good enough to give $100 million and go film it. Just crazy. Insane product placement. Like, everything that can go wrong goes wrong with this movie. Unfrosted. I'm a big Jerry Seinfeld fan. I can't say that I actually had particularly high hopes for a Jerry Seinfeld comedy But given that he's been working on this Pop-Tart joke for over a decade, like he did an interview a decade ago talking about writing this joke. And in the interview, he says punchlines that are in the movie. I've probably been working on this for two years. In comedy, what you do is you think of something that you think is funny and then you go from there. I like the first line to be funny right away. When I was a kid and they invented the Pop-Tart, the back of my head blew right off. And that, that got the whole thing started, that a specific part of my head blew off. Not just my head, but just the back. I took one bite, and then blew the back of my head right off! So I was curious. I thought maybe there'd be something to it. And this movie just did not work for me at all. The, the tone was too wacky. The central premise feels super niche, where it's like an in-joke for people that were seven years old in 1962. That's what the whole movie feels like. And I wasn't in on the joke, so I didn't get it. So the tone's all over the place. It's a bunch of wacky, over-the-top performances, insanity. I didn't get it. Garfield. I grew up watching the old Garfield and Friends animated show. But Garfield itself, the inherent nature of of it, coming from the comic strips where it's, you know, three panels, punchline. And then on the Garfield and Friends show, essentially it's 23-minute long episodes broken up into three different chunks. The first segment is a six-minute Garfield short, and then you have the U.S. Acres bits, and then one more Garfield bit. But they're just six-minute bits, five-minute bits, because sometimes they have a short at the beginning. Just quick scenarios. Trying to adapt three panels and a punchline, six-minute shorts into a 90-minute feature-length story means inherently you've got to fill in a lot of gaps and fill it out. And it felt to me with this movie that they filled out in the gaps with just blockbuster cliches. So now Garfield, which is historically about a lazy cat that likes to eat lasagna and is annoyed by anyone that wants to do anything. Or on vacation, we got to go. I have to do work to go relax. I can relax at home. I just simple stuff like just lazy cat. And it makes it a story about 
his daddy issues, and a train heist. There's a bunch of Mission Impossible inspirations, and I, I just don't get it. <laughs> I don't get what they were going for here. Uh, it's it the Garfieldisms, the laziness, cat eating lasagna, picking on Odie, John Arbuckle, all the stuff that's the classic stuff feels all sidelined. For Dad, what happened to you? How are we going to get on the train? <laughs> like spl plotting the heist, and that's just not what Garfield is. Argyle! This was one of my most anticipated films of the year. I enjoyed it more than most people. It, I don't think it's one of the worst movies of the year, but it also is a very goofy film that just leans too far into the camp, has too many plot twists, and goes too wild with the meta ideas. It's like a movie that's too clever for its own good and just kind of gets sillier and sillier as it goes along. So I had a lot of fun watching it in the theater, it's it's wild enough that it just had a, I had a smile on my face. But it's the sort of movie that you kind of sit out and you go, ah, I just, of all the things that Matthew Vaughn could have done with a, a spy, a meta spy film, I, I don't think that was it. I think you, you picked kind of a weird way to go with it. Um, and it, like it's, even in the interviews, he talks about how this movie is like the fourth book in a series and the post credit scene teases this other thing and... The, the book Argyle that the movie's based off of is, um, <laughs> is, is like the second book. Like, it's so weird. It just, um, like, it's like a movie that they just got completely lost in themselves. It, it's got a Romancing the Stone vibe to it that I'm very much into. There's things that I really dug about it, but too clever for its own good. The Watchers, the very first movie from M. Night Shyamalan's daughter, e, uh, Ishana Shyamalan. I was actually able to interview her the day after uh, seeing the film, which was a very cool experience. And so with this film, one of the things I really enjoyed about it is how on the surface, it's this horror thriller, but the deeper you dive in, suddenly it's fantasy and yes. then Irish lore is blended yes. in there. What made you to decide to adapt a book that is kind of this genre blender as your directorial debut? I mean, I think it was exactly that. I think I enjoy um, those particular genres and all of the kind of rich mythology and world building around it. Um, but I thought it was such a cool choice that the author made to kind of start out as this really accessible kind of tense thriller to take you into an unexpected larger world. Um, and so that felt really, really compelling and smart to me that it was like coming from a very grounded place and then moves to a much more uh, surreal place. Okay. It's almost like that's the rapper and yes. there's that sweet core to it is the, all the rich lore that yeah. you get to explore with him. Yeah. But like so many of her father's films, it's a movie that has a lot of interesting ideas. The, the premise is probably stronger than the actual execution. And some of that boils down to, you, you have some interesting ideas about the, the setup with the people in these woods, where it kind of goes, where it blends together a number of different genres and kind of what's actually going on in this location and why is this, this facility here? Like what's happening? There's a, there's a lot of intrigue that kind of works. It, then if you stop and you just try and play out the mechanics, play out the logic. How is this built? Wait, with this road right next to it? Wait, wait a minute. What happened here? What ha you just play out the logic and there's too many questions. And, you know, there's movies where there's plot holes, but you're just so engaged with the story, the emotion, the characters that you ignore all of that. And here, the forward momentum of the story isn't strong enough. The thrills don't have you enough on the edge of your seat. And the characters aren't engaging enough to overcome those hurdles. So there's interesting ideas let down by the execution. In a Violent Nature. Now, this is a slasher film that essentially the concept is what if you did a Friday the 13th movie from the perspective of Jason? and you follow him around as he's stalking these people. And that's 75% what this movie is. They, it breaks perspective just enough to be able to make a few other things happen. And then we follow our equivalent of Jason in the movie. So I saw this at a, the Overlook Film Festival 
a couple months before it came out. There's a lot of buzz surrounding it because that is an interesting concept. If you are a Friday the 13th fan, if you're into slashers, I think that this is absolutely a movie worth checking out as an experiment to see if you resonate with it. Does it work for you? Give it a try. See what happens. But the experiment didn't fully work for me. There's one all-time great kill in here, a couple other ones that are a little bit interesting. If you just play it out, though, you can see where the problem problems happen, where a movie about following Jason Voorhees walking through the woods involves a lot of him walking through the woods. <laughs> in fact, they joked about that before the movie started, how it's, oh, it's one of the most soothing movies you'll ever see. And you watch it and you go, it is very soothing because he's like, Ch -ch 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 -ch, through the woods. And there's a cadence to it. That was a big part of the Q&A afterwards, how he was so good at walking in the woods and having this perfect cadence of his walking. And it just has this soothing rhythm to it, soothing nature sounds to it. And it's a lot of that. So there's the novelty of it. It's worth checking out if this is a genre that you really like. And maybe you'll like it more than I did. But I don't think it actually was all that effective in general. And some of that, I think, is they what, they got a little bit too clever. They they tried to... they Even in the Q&A, talked about how they wanted to make a schlocky slasher film, but also make it a little bit art house. And, um, they, you know, they set a bunch of stuff. Like, we want to do make it make a nature documentary that's actually a slasher. And, and things that just got... It almost came pretentious while making a very non-pretentious film. And that's what I felt while watching it. Final movie on here, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Now, I gave this movie a positive review. I stand by that. I liked this movie. I think it is good. It is not as good as it could have been or should have been. Hence, it's on this list and disappointed me. Where the basic setup that it's the, first, it's the only Ghostbusters movie we've ever had where it starts off with the Ghostbusters in business doing their thing. That in itself is fresh. We are in New York City. We're telling a fresh new story with new ghosts kind of showing up. There's a bunch of stuff here that's like, yes, this is the Ghostbusters film that we haven't had. They said they were inspired a great deal like by the real Ghostbusters animated show that I grew up watching. That And you feel that watching it. They're in business. There's different types of ghosts. We're expanding the lore. Different characters getting involved. Uh, we're talking about what, what um, Winston has been up to and using his resources and then all sorts of cool stuff. Bunch of interesting things happening here. The actual execution is pretty rough. Um, it's a movie that feels like a good bit was chopped out of the movie or reworked a little bit, maybe reshoots. There's a bunch of stuff that you can see in the trailer in particular for the third act that's not in the movie. And they wear like these orange red jumpsuits and that's not really a thing in the movie. And you're like, so what happened there? Um, like it's called Frozen Empire, but that's only like the last 20 minutes of the movie. And it, so it just felt like something was, was just kind of off a little bit where... Um, you have to keep in mind that Ivan Reitman, the original director of the first Ghostbusters, was very involved in the making of Afterlife. His son, Jason, directed Afterlife. And shortly after that movie came out, he died. And this movie is only coming out two and a half years later. That's a, that's a pretty big, very personal loss. Like you're losing a, a key person just from the work side to it, but also... That's something that is a weight that's carried by pretty much everyone that worked on the film of actual loss and re life, real life happening. And you feel like they, they probably needed another year because, you know, they'll, you have to shoot a year before your movie comes out, which means they're writing the script while processing death. And he goes, is that the best? Like, is that the it, maybe maybe I'm totally wrong and I'm reading into it, but. You look at the timeline of things and you think they probably needed another year to iron out the kinks in the script and take the stuff that I really enjoyed about the premise, but also have a refined, tight script that uh, the plot mechanics work and we're not reworking it in the editing room. So I, I enjoyed having this kind of live action, the real Ghostbusters. But there are a lot of flaws here, and I see why it didn't work for a number of people. 
So those are my picks for the biggest surprises and disappointments for the year. Let me know your picks down below in the comment section. Check out my other mid-year content right over here. Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much.